These are live animals, the weapons are real. If you go off of the form or you start doing your own thing, then anything can really happen. Everything your brain tells you to do when you're on a horse is pretty much wrong. I think it's important for people to see just the bond between you know, humans and animals and to see how you can communicate without using words. Well, you feel the difference? Now he knows when your foot's on a step, something changes. We fight fast, we hit hard, and it is unique. We come to work and we're very lucky to put on a costume and be nice and sword fight. Go push him, Colton! It's like everyone here loves the animals. If you ask anyone that's been doing this for a long time, they always say it's, it's the horses. I'll never give up on anybody here, whether it be a horse or, or a human being. I am Edward Machachik. I'm the head knight here at the Scottsdale, Arizona Castle for Medieval Times. All we want him to do is keep moving forward. We don't want him to back up at all. If I hear him step on a bag, then he'll get a treat. We start him slow, and our practice here is that we do it right once, take your time, patience, and consistency, and then the horse will love to do it until they can't do it, like us. And it's all baby steps, right? So we don't want to rush him into it. If a horse gets a positive experience when he's scared about something, it'll save you years of trouble. If you try to force a horse through aggression or whipping him or trying to literally just forcing this animal to go through something that they're not comfortable with, you lose their trust and then, just like anyone that you know, any person, if you, if you lose their trust, you don't gain it back, right? Their eyes have not developed through the years to adjust as fast as human eyes, right? Like we can go into a dark room, give it a few seconds and we can start seeing. With them, it's still with the sunrise, sunset, if you will. So they have to completely trust you and have a good bond with you. If they're even going back into a dark tunnel, they don't know what's back there. It's just darkness, right? So that's why the bag's on the ground, it's the abyss to them. So this is actually the horse box has been working on for a while. So before, when he got him, he wasn't even able to put a halter on him. He was so head shy and skittish. So just through creating that bond and just letting him know that he could trust us and at the same time making him feel accomplished when he does things that seem minuscule or like a little smaller to us. It's, they're, they are big leaps for the horse because he doesn't know what this black bag is. <laughs> and in a perfect world, if we do this every day, eventually he'll actually search for the bags. He'll seek it out because one, it's something that's a fear that he got over himself. Good boy, yeah, there you go. It's something that he got over and as, as well as he, he knows he gets rewarded when he does something like this. Good boy. To even start being considered to be a knight, you have to start as a squire. We start all of our guys in the stables first for two weeks to get comfortable with and familiar with the horses. From there, they come down, they shadow a squire that's already in the show. I select about two or three at a time, and then they go into what we call like pipe training. And we teach them the basics of sword fighting with the pipes. Once we deem that you're physically fit enough to do, do this job safely, then we do this, we lunge you on his back. But you don't have reins, you don't have stirrups. You could even start out bareback and you just put your arms out to the side. So it's all from ground up and from the basics and the fundamentals of how to stay safe while you're fighting, from that foundation we build the excitement, speed and power from there. Our weapons are more functional than they are pretty. You can buy pretty swords that we have in the sword shop and everything, but the ones that we use are very functional, just big hunks of metal to smash into each other. We like sparks in the show, but that being said, the, the way we create the sparks is when you hit 90 degrees on 90 degrees, it creates burrs or like little divots in the sword. And when those little divots hit together, the little burrs sticking out, when you hit that, that friction causes that spark. And so it blows up all nice and big. Like small burrs, they, it's, it's very hard to actually see, but you can feel them if you ran your hand across them or if you were to get hit by the sword and then the sword pulled through you'd be able to feel that. And it would, it would catch the costume, tear at the costume. I got many scratches on my belt from uh, being uh, hit in the show. So we gotta take those off so that they're not razor blade sharp. We do try to blend modern technology to make our jobs easier. So like you saw when we were grinding the weapons and everything, we're not using a little foot pedal thing to start grinding tiles, just take forever. It's really important to keep it symmetrical and it's one consistent long swoop of it because it's very easy to put too much pressure at one point or too little pressure at one point. So then and it's a delicate balance of not cutting too much off so we still get sparks in the show but keeping it safe. We also don't want to take off the divots too, too deep. It would create a valley in the sword and it would just compromise the integrity of the sword. And it would actually make it weaker and then it would break in the show. In medieval tournaments, since they weren't to the death, they would they weren't dulled, but they weren't sharpened at the edge because the second you would hit edge on edge, you would ruin the swords. The swords were expensive, you know, so the, the weapons you would use in 
tournaments would be slightly flat like this. It is a real weapon. It's made out of titanium. You can hold it. It's nice and light. The only reason it is titanium is because it's a little lighter for us, so we can swing it, and the sparks look really nice and sharp. Their eyes not being able to adjust as quick, and especially how much the lights change here, that really is a testament to how much they trust us. That when things happen, like when plates fall, I mean, it's metal plate on metal plate. That's a loud noise. It sounds like a gunshot. They might jump because it's reactive. Oh, yeah, good boy. But then they instantly put their ears into us and be like, what do I do now? When they look to you, and if as long as you stay calm and relax on them, and be like, that, eh, that was nothing. Like, oh, okay, it's not bad. He's still a little hesitant there, but he's going through it because he's trusting him. You can see his ears are back, listening to him, and they're not pinned back. They're not identifying as like, he's trying to attack something or he's nervous. He's, he's listening to his handler, right? We want to be their comfort. We want them to know that they can trust us, that if something goes wrong, we want them to look to us to see what we want them to do, as opposed to the opposite effect of when they, if the horse doesn't trust the rider or the handler, then when something happens, they just run. It's very unique to be around horses. So we've never seen a horse in their entire life until they come to see our show. So we have to prepare them for people who do not know anything about them. So some people might think it's okay to like pop out and scare them. So we need them to just look at them. Why'd you do that? <laughs> their jaw is tight and they're not moving it, then they can't drool. They're just, they're, they're tight and they're not relaxing. If they're opening their mouth and just doing that and like drooling all over, that's like the height of their relax. They're just hanging out. Yeah, and that's a great sign that when they're tense or when they're nervous, it's just like us, you tense up, you get all tightened. So when he can do that and like, that's a sign that he's relaxing his jaw and he's calming down. They outweigh us, they're stronger than us. If you force the horses to do it, you might get away with it for a little while, but eventually the, the horse just stops doing what you want them to do, right? You can't force them to do it. They have to enjoy it. We want them to enjoy when we bring them down. We don't want them to be trembling. If they're walking down the ramp, and like, what's gonna happen? We don't want them to be like, oh, this is the fun thing I get to do all day. He's not trembling, he's calm, his posture's nice and relaxed. He's just going to his main handler all the time. My name is Anthony Ammon. I am the Master Falconer here. Uh, just a kid in high school needed a job, so I went to the castle. I was doing sound and light for a few years and then retail. And then about 15 years ago, I got offered a position to fly birds and train birds. And I've been doing that ever since. And I love it and I can't imagine myself doing anything else. What we do here is important because it's real. It's a place that you can go and physically see people doing things. Uh, I have so many people come up to me every day and they're amazed that this bird is real. Uh, they think I'm holding a fake animatronic bird and then when they realize it's an actual living, breathing animal, they're amazed. And to me, it's a, a daily thing, but for them, it's something they never see. They don't see it all the time. We're working with other people and we're working with animals. So safety between you and your fellow employees and you and the animals is extremely important because if you make a wrong move, if you mess up, this bird's life is in my hands every day. So if I do something wrong and something happens to her, then that's on me. If you look at the horse right there, for example, the majority of his weight, you can see where the rider is. The majority of the weight is going to be in the front, right? Because that's where his neck is, and it's just think of like a lever. If you put something on the end, it's going to be heavier. So it's our job to train them to drive from the back end to the front so then they can develop the proper muscles. It's almost like when your mother or father tell you to walk with your back straight all the time, right? It might not be comfortable at first, but then when you get older, you're not going to be just walking around like this all day, right? So that's the same idea. We're just trying to make the horses to walk with their back straight. You need to separate your lower body and your upper body so then when you are, when they get scared or anything, you're consistent with how you're communicating to them. You're not leaning on the reins or heaving or anything to balance yourself. The balance comes all from your legs. Very nice. If you get those muscles developed in the back end, then they can be really light in the forehand and they can move elastically so it looks more elegant, if you would. So that's why we do this. So he's learning how to balance with just his legs, keep his hands out, and then when his hands start getting steady and he can move them around without bouncing around, then he can put reins in his hand and know that he's not gonna be just popping him in the mouth over and over again. Now let's see if we can get close to the wall. Very nice. Eh. Perfect. All right, let's end on that. That was perfect. 
the riding is first. You have to be able to ride and understand how to communicate with the horse, and then that's the most important thing. Well, Colton, do you see when you're riding, you're doing this. You're hunching, you have to be tall, proud, chest out, right? You have to ride in position. There you go, yes, much better. With a jousting, it's very specific on how your hands have to be even to how much of the rein can be in your hand to where the knot has to be on the horse's neck, what leg pressure does what at what point, because we train the horses and then they have to ride them and not screw them up, if you will, right? There, go, 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 good push. That was a good catch, good correction. All right, let's get some gear. When you're cantering at another guy and you see that lance coming in, it's very natural to just kind of you know, brace for yourself. The form keeps them safe by keeping everything away from their body so we can have those high impacts. It has to be broken down to the most minute detail and then just repeat it over and over again so it becomes fluid. You have to get that feeling of that slide of the reins up and then right into it, okay? So he feels that knot right on top of his neck so he knows he's, he's good, he's safe, he knows his job. Right? The form is what keeps everyone safe, and the form is what makes it look real. So if you, they deviate from the form, it actually just looks worse. Even if they feel it's, it's better, it's like when you watch footage or when you watch when the joust happens, if, the, if you use the form, you stay safe and you get huge impacts. Go! Joust position, that was a lot slower. All right, one more pass and then you're gonna do a fall. Everything your brain tells you to do when you're on a horse is pretty much wrong. So if you're about to fall, you wanna grab on, but you don't wanna do that because it's in the horse's mouth, so it's not fair to him. And you're going down, you're like that, you're compacting and everything's gonna go right into the, all of your weight is on that one part, which right now is this little, tiny little piece of muscle, right? Your tendon's gonna pop out, okay? Everything we do is based on the safety to make sure that we can do this day in and day out because one thing that's unique with us is we could do three shows a day and it's three full shows a day, right? So it's like from beginning to end, then we set up for the next one, the beginning to end, it's not condensed for any sort of reason or anything like that. So it's like all the fights that everyone does and what the training on. And then here's the day-to-day -day board that we change all the time. It breaks down what we do before the show to make sure that when they cut in, they're not guessing. They're, they all are really good and they get to work right away, but it's easier just to have it written down so then when they come in, they don't have to prepare for it. From the second when they walk into the doors, it's everyone, even the, the servers and everything else, they're all part of the cast, if you will, because they stay in character, so then you get immersed into it. It's about a two-hour show that we put on here. It's neat because you get to see animals and humans interact in an environment that you normally don't get to see anywhere else. There are jobs for animals that they can enjoy doing and that this way like this allows them to still be here right because we don't really need horses. If you look at like in our modern world we don't need carriages we don't plow fields with them or anything else so we're very fortunate to have them and to have this kind of opportunity to have them have a job which gives us a job. I learned I was very impatient <laughs> before I started working with horses. The horse doesn't care who you are, where you're from, how much money's in your bank account. It just, if you make him upset, he'll let you know. When you come here, that's a memory that you've created with yourself, that you can create with your family, or your friends, like your best friends. And that's something that you can always go back to whenever you need to. Just being immersed in that, it's very different than seeing something on a digital screen. You cover all the senses, you know, the sight, the sound, everything. Is, it's all here. So when you unite more of the senses together, that experience becomes more full, in my opinion. On top of that, it is a live show, so every time you come, it's going to be different. I try to keep the job fun because that's what keeps people coming back. And then when the audience sees that we are enjoying ourselves, then I think that's when it's a more collective experience for everybody.